Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We are looking this week at the great controversy and looking at our second installment, our second episode, this one on the central issue, love or selfishness, a fascinating subject. And we're going to dive into some of the greatest questions that people have about God and about Christianity in this week's lesson. But before we begin, let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you for being with us again as we take a look at this significant subject of the great controversy. And this week, as we take a look at love or selfishness, help us to understand better the character of love that you have so that we can better understand your plans for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are grateful once again also to have back the author of this quarter's uh, study guide, and that is Pastor Mark Finley. He is an international author, speaker, and evangelist, and much-loved friend here at It Is Written. Pastor Mark, welcome back once again. Thank you, Pastor Eric. Always enjoy working with you to share God's Word. Absolutely, and that is what we are doing this quarter, a significant subject. And this week in lesson number two, the central issue, love or selfishness. Now, you begin this week's lesson by taking a look at the destruction of Jerusalem and thousands of people were, were slaughtered in the destruction of Jerusalem. It's kind of a, it's an interesting way to start a, a, a week that talks about love. Help us to understand that a little bit more. Well, you know, a lot of people ask the question, if God is love, why is there so much suffering in our world? We talked a little bit about that in lesson number one. But when you look at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, God had borne along with his people for millenniums, sending prophets, sending messages of appeal, sending messages of love. He sent his own son, Jesus Christ, who ultimately was crucified. So the destruction of Jerusalem shows that God himself is a loving God making appeals for generations and centuries. And then in addition to that, the lesson on Monday for, for a Sunday, for example, a broken hearted savior, that lesson reveals that Jesus weeps over the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, there's a wonderful Bible passage in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 and 38, that I think comes to the very heart of the answer to your question. Matthew 23, verse 37, 38. You can almost hear the pathos in Jesus' voice here. You almost can hear the love in his tones and you could almost see the tears rolling down his cheeks when he says, Matthew 23, 37, 38, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to you, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left you desolate, for I say to you, you'll see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, my love for you is, is endless, limitless. I've sent messages of rebuke and messages of repentance to you. I've reached out to you. I revealed my son to you. You saw him when he touched the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, and you saw his miracles, but you would not. Here we find a God that has done everything he could to save Jerusalem. And, you know, actually the destruction of Jerusalem is a symbol. It's a symbolic portrayal, although it really happened, of course, but it's, it's a symbol of destruction of the world at end time. And this same God is appealing to humanity today to accept his love and grace and be saved from the destruction that's to come. You know, this idea that God allows bad things to happen because he doesn't care is, is popular outside of Christendom, and, and it's often used as an argument against Christianity. But what we see as we read the Bible is that that's not the case. It's not that God doesn't care. It's not that he's heartless, that he's a tyrant. He does care about his children, and he's doing what he can 
to help them make the right decisions, to make the right choices and, and head in the right direction. And even though the destruction of Jerusalem was, was terrible, was horrible, there was a, a silver lining, if we can call it that, in that there were some who escaped, some who did not meet destruction. How did that come to pass? You know, Jesus gave the warning. And uh, that's another aspect of his love. Jesus uh, puts it this way in Matthew 24, verse 15, when he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's the approach of the Roman armies to surround Jerusalem, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, uh, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not come down to take anything. Let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. And then he says, pray that your fight be not in the winter on the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus pointed out that the Roman soldiers would surround the city. But as they were approaching, Jesus said, when you see this, it's a signal that the city is going to be destroyed. So flee. Now, the interesting thing about it is that uh, Cestius, the Roman general, in 69 AD, came to destroy the city. And as he came, for some reason, he pulled back and didn't destroy it. The Christians knew that that was a sign that the city would be destroyed. They fled, and we are told that not one Christian lost their life in the destruction of Jerusalem. So again, you see two things on God's love. One, the repeated warnings that he gave to Israel and the Jewish nation that the city would be destroyed and the appeals in his love. But secondly, he said, when you see the Roman armies come, so this was not something exclusively for Christians only, but it was for anybody who wanted to flee, who heard the word of God and Christians did and they fled. So in other words, you see God's love trying to protect his people from the destruction. So God in, in Old Testament times as well as New Testament times has given warnings, he's given promises of his watch care for people. Um, what kind of promises are there in, in the Old Testament that help us to understand that God's presence is there with us even when we are in times of trial today? Oh, there's some wonderful promises that I I think one of my favorite, Eric, is uh, Isaiah 41, verse 10. In Isaiah 41, 10, it is um, a very, very precious promise. It says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. In other words, don't be confused, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, God says, don't fear. Don't be all confused. He says, I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to uphold you. Then, of course, you take a psalm like uh, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear that the earth be removed and the mountains carried into the midst of the sea? And so God is our refuge and strength. So you have these wonderful promises in the Bible. Psalm 91, a thousand will fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come nigh you. For he'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. So you have these promises that as we're faithful to God, he is there with us in the trials, the difficulties, the challenges of life. So he's there. Now, some people misunderstand that to mean that if God is there with you, that he will automatically preserve your life or keep you from getting sick or, or miraculously heal you if you happen to become ill. But we read the New Testament story of the New Testament church. They went through trials. They went through persecution. They, they experienced death. Uh, yet the church grew rapidly. How did that happen with that kind of persecution? As Christians, we are not playthings of the devil. So the devil doesn't have free access to us to do whatever he wants to do. If God, because of natural causes, allows suffering, it can accomplish the purpose of deeper faith, deeper trust, deeper dependence upon him. And so uh, it's not that a Christian will never get sick. It's not a Christian that will never have deformities. It's not that at all. It's not that a Christian will never die in a car accident. 
It is rather in the controversy between good and evil, God allows natural processes to work out, but he promises, Matthew 28, verse 20, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Hebrews 13, I'll never leave you, I'll forsake you. So God is there with us in every challenge of life to strengthen us. But those challenges in the context of suffering, being in a very real world, those challenges deepen our faith and they can draw us closer to him. Now that's a pretty deep subject and perhaps a subject that somebody might want to dig more deeply into. We've, we've touched it, we've scratched the surface as it were, but it's an important one. There is a companion book to this quarter's Sabbath school lesson that's called The War Between Good and Evil. It's a, a supplement, a companion to what we're studying in this quarter's lesson. Uh, you've written this book. What is in this book and why might someone want to pick it up and delve into its depths? What would they get out of it if they picked up this companion book? Well, a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, it will take the themes that we've been studying in the Sabbath School lesson and broaden them. I'll add a lot more, a uh, lot more illustrations. I will explain Bible text more fully. But on this subject of if God is good, why is the world so bad and human suffering, and the intensity of our faith, we'll delve into that in chapter two, and we'll look at the the fact that. Um, God is there with us in human suffering. So the companion book really helps us to uh, round out these subjects, deepens our understanding, and is filled with practical illustrations. And if this is something that you would like to pick up, and I hope that you will because you will get a great deal out of it, it's very easy to find this companion book. Just go to itiswritten.shop. Again, that's itiswritten.shop and you're looking for the book, The War Between Good and Evil by Pastor Mark Finley. As you read that book, as you dig into it, as you study it, you are going to get a clearer picture of who God is, a clearer picture of his character, and a much clearer picture of his love for you. Now, you may trust God, you may believe in him, but you may know some people who have a difficult time trusting in God or believing that he loves them, or that he cares about them. This will be an important book for you to pick up so that you can share these great themes with them in a way that is winsome, that is compelling, and that will draw them closer to their Savior. Again, you can find that book at itiswritten.shop. We're going to be back in just a moment as we continue looking at the great controversy, this, this difference between love and selfishness. We'll be right back. If you'd like to deepen your understanding of the powerful themes brought out in this program, we invite you to explore the book, The Great Controversy. For more information, simply text the code GC24 to 71392. This book delves into critical end time themes, offering profound insights into historical events, Bible prophecy, and spiritual preparation essential for today's unique challenges. Discover how The Great Controversy can illuminate your path in these uncertain times. He was the first person ever created, the father of the human family, and his life is marked by the greatest fall in the history of humankind. He was present when God promised redemption to the world, and he witnessed the devastating effects of sin on his family and on his planet. Don't miss the first episode in the new It Is Written series, Great Characters of the Bible, as we look at the life of Adam, a journey into Scripture that takes us to some of humanity's deepest lows, and yet speaks of the promise of the highest points of human history. Great characters of the Bible, the story of Adam, a story of tremendous failure, of tremendous success, and of the grace of a loving God. Great characters of the Bible, Adam, brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. Pastor Mark, let's come back to where we left off just a moment ago on persecution and trial and tribulation and death. These are things that 
we experience today that humanity has suffered ever since the fall back in the Garden of Eden. But when we look at the trials, the persecution, the death that Christians have gone through, especially in ages past, we see how this led to a spread of the gospel. How are those two linked together? You know, it's amazing when you look, for example, at uh, the book of Acts. I was thinking of one specific experience in the book of Acts when Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. And um, as they uh, go into prison here in, in Acts, the scripture tells the story of them uh, in prison singing praises to God. The prison walls fall down in a great earthquake. The Roman jailer is so astounded, he's about ready to fall on the sword and commit suicide because of the fact that if the prisoners get away, the Romans will take his life. Paul says, don't do that. And as this prison guard, uh, this keeper of the prison, uh, as he sees Paul and Silas, his heart is open. Paul preaches to him and he's converted his entire household. So here you have an instance of Paul and Silas in chains, beaten, bloody back, bruised, black and blue, singing praises to God. And in the context of that suffering, the Roman centurion or the Roman guard who never would have come to Christ if they weren't in prison, most likely. Now, God could have had some other way. I don't know. But God used suffering to bring them to Jesus. And I think of the fact of take Paul. He's on a boat going to Rome. He's shipwrecked. And uh, the entire crew hears about the goodness of God. Or you think about Paul when he's imprisoned in Rome, and he says even some of Caesar's household, some of Caesar's household accepts the gospel. So you can see very, very clearly in scripture that suffering does not destroy witness. It really enhances it. In fact, you remember the Tertullian, the, one of the early church leaders said this, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. The more they try to kill us, the more we grow. And there was no shortage of persecution and no shortage of the spread of the gospel. So we see that, uh, that evidenced out in history. One of the great commands that Jesus gave to his followers, to his church, to Christianity, is to love one another. Now, what did the New Testament church practically do to demonstrate what it meant to love one another? There's a couple things that I think are interesting in the text. Then I want to add something, a historical narrative that I've read recently by an author by the name of Rodney Starkey, um, just a marvelous material. But first you look at the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, they ate together with a common meal. They fellowshiped and prayed together. They shared their wealth and resources together. Very practical. You come to Acts chapter 6, where you have widows that are short of food. And they, um, New Testament church provides that food for them. When in Jerusalem there is a famine, Paul takes up a famine relief offering to help the church at Jerusalem to have adequate nourishment and adequate food. You look at some of the miracles that were worked of healing. So the New Testament church had a broad-based ministry, physical, mental, spiritual healing. Rodney Starkey looked at the second and third century of Christian growth, which, which would be about 100 to 200 AD, the second century, and 200 to 300 AD, the third century. And he... Um, looked at, there were two times that the church just catapulted ahead in growth. One was when there was a great pandemic or plague in 160 AD, and the other one was in 260 AD. But at that time, the pagans, because the disease was spreading so rapidly, there were city, there were whole villages where 90% of the population or thereabouts died. People were loading the bodies in the streets, in the cities. And the pagans would simply take their father, their mother, their child who got these diseases, throw them out in the street and let them die. Christians came and the Christian nurses, for example, would come and try to nurse those people back to health and many of the Christian nurses died themselves. And Rodney Starkey says, it was the love of these Christians 
and the demonstration of that love that won so many hearts and led people back and led many of the pagans to Jesus. You know, that's a, that's a powerful uh, story. And in fact, you, uh, you reference it, I think, on page 19 on Thursday's lesson of, uh, of this particular, uh, of this week. Uh, I wanna read that in its, in its entirety. I think it's powerful. It says, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. You know, as you look at the New Testament church, what's a characteristic, a word, a, a thought uh, that you think really encapsulates what helped the Christian church in these, in these days, in these years to grow? Well, you know, that's an interesting statement, the one you just read, and I'll come right to your question. That was written by uh, Dionysus, who wrote a lengthy tribute to the heroic nursing efforts of the local Christians. You know, he's one of the very early Christian writers. And so this was something written by himself. You know, I think, uh, Eric, one of the things that helped the early Christian church to grow was this sense of compassion, that God had created every human being in his image. And when these early Christians came to Christ and they accepted the love that flows from Calvary, and they saw this multifaceted ministry of Jesus. Jesus had a multifaceted ministry. It says he went about in Matthew chapter 4. See, what, what made the church grow was these early Christians were imitating the ministry of Christ. And if you look, for example, at Matthew chapter 4, uh, it talks about in verse 23, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all the kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So Jesus taught them the principles of the kingdom of God that gave them a better life. Jesus preached to them the message of salvation that transformed them. And Jesus was a healer. He was concerned about their bodies. He was concerned about their health. He was concerned about their physical life as well. So when you look at this entire panorama, this story of the growth of Christianity. It's because the New Testament church was so moved by the love of Christ, so inspired by his example, that they went out to meet the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs of people. So it really was a, a holistic ministry, W-H-O-L. Uh, he ministered, as you said, preaching and teaching and healing. That's what the early Christian church was like, and, and I, I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that Christianity would probably be a whole lot more popular today if we took a holistic, W-H-O-L, holistic approach to ministering to, uh, to others as well. Let me come back to, uh, to what we're talking about in this week. One of, one of the, the areas we're talking about is, is persecution. There's, of course, just the the evil that comes upon us living in a, a sin-cursed fallen world. But there's also persecution. What function, what positive function does persecution serve? When we look at, you know, why are good people persecuted? Why are, are helpful people um, attacked? What, what role does persecution serve? Well, first, we don't desire persecution as Christians. We don't get on our knees and say, oh, Lord, send the persecution, you know. So that's that's not something that we are desiring, saying, hallelujah, let me sing the doxology. I just got persecuted, you know, not at all. Uh, but persecution is the result of men and women who stand for Christ, men and women who are faithful to Christ in an evil, sinful world. What value does persecution have or what function does it have? First, persecution enables the individual being persecuted to deepen their faith. You look at Huss and Jerome and, and Huss particularly in a filthy prison for weeks, months. And he said that when he was in there, it was a precious experience with Jesus. You look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was imprisoned during the Second World War by the Nazi regime, who said that the Psalms became the precious 
guide of his life. So when you look at persecution, first thing it does is it deepens the faith of the one persecuted. The second thing that persecution does is that it, when, when others see that faith deepened, it inspires them, it, it encourages them. Not long ago, I had an anointing service of a dear friend of mine, a, a lady, I've known she and her husband for many years, um, and she was diagnosed with a very, very serious cancer. She's doing well now, incidentally, and we anointed her. But I will tell you, her faith, her positive attitude, her courage, her never blaming God inspired both me and my wife, Tini, immeasurably. So I think persecution can deepen one's faith. It can inspire others looking by. And I think when one hangs on to Christ in the midst of persecution, it impresses as well those unbelievers, and they then can respond to the grace of God because they see grace in action. So persecution gives God an opportunity to shine in a person's life. Not something that we desire, not something we want or look for or ask for, but it presents an opportunity for people to get a better picture of who God is and his love for us. Uh, one quick question is we're kind of tying things together here. How can a local church become a more loving, caring entity in the community? I think that um, as churches are on their knees seeking God, asking God for a vision of what he wants that church to be in the community. I think this is a matter of prayer. It's a matter of seeking God. Secondly, it's a matter of assessing the needs of the community and uh, having the church meet those needs. The church is the body of Christ, redeemed by grace, filled with love, meeting needs everywhere. So, Pastor Mark, this week we've taken a look at the central issue being love or selfishness. Jesus is depicted, if you could depict Jesus in one word, it would be love. If you were to depict the Father in one word, it would be love. And if we hoped that people in our community could depict us in one word, it would probably be love as well. And as we become less selfish and more like Christ by the grace of God, that's what's going to happen. Pastor Mark, thank you once again Amen. for being thank with you. us this week. And thank you once again for joining us as well. We'll be back again next week as we continue our journey through the great controversy. We look forward to seeing you then. This has been Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written.